Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Chinese uh, defense. Let me bring my coffee. Where is the coffee? Is it the one back there? Probably the one back there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the uh, committee uh, consists of uh, David Lieberman, the National Chief Examiner. He's not that outside, of course, outside, inside. Uh, Derek Gravity, Andrew Levitt, who is teaching a class with left some questions, and myself. And um, we are running, I think, fine. We have a uh, candidate presentation to this position. Well, so we have ample time. Okay, so. Go ahead. It's okay with everybody. I like to start with playing a song. studying music for a while. 
And um, to me, that sounds exactly like what I did here. Um, when I play a melody, I am already remaking it. In the first melodic statement, that is when I start playing the song, when I play the melody, I remake that melody in my own sensibility. And when I play it again, that is to kind of, to continue the process of improvisation, the way I was taught, um, what you do is you start very slowly, you start inserting phrases where there was silence, and you start putting silence where there were phrases, and you continue that process again and again, and you begin to remake that. So, this idea of remaking became kind of central to my understanding of what I was doing. Um, I'm not going to read very much, but one thing I do want to touch on is the idea of inflection. Um, this is a word that I actually didn't really use very much with my teacher from um, my music lessons, but um, it kind of came to me throughout my uh, work on the thesis that this was kind of a concept that I was interested in or kind of described what I was doing most cogently. So this is what I wrote. Um, uh, in my thesis, at the beginning of my thesis. An inflection is a modulation or change in the form of any given thing. In speech, words are given inflections in their intonation, articulation, and rhythm. The meaning of a single word can be conveyed in any number of ways depending on the inflection the speaker gives it when it is uttered. In other words, the inflection is the way the word is said. To extend this phrase into the material world, the inflection is the way a particular thing comes into being, either accidentally or deliberately through purposeful making. This thesis is an investigation into the life. So I'll hope that after I'm through talking and showing you all these objects, that um, you get a better idea of what I mean by inflection. Um, and just to kind of give you a broad overview of um, what I did throughout this process. So I began here, and I started working with wood, with this knife, kind of, at first, kind of non-deliberately working with the wood, and then making a series of objects, and then painting them in ink, and then making spoons, and then making carving tools, more carving tools, um, and then I got into copper working, and at first I made a set of copper making tools. I made a series of copper making objects. And then the final part of this thesis is a renovation of a tea house that I built in 2012, and I worked on the tea house after I finished this phase. Um, so there's a lot of making involved in this thesis. But the making I interpret through this idea of remaking. So as I'm making everything, I'm not making a thing in isolation, but I'm trying to remake the thing that came before it. I'm trying to always have this thing kind of extend from the original quality um, that I observed in the piece of wood. So I'm going to come back to music for a second because I think it's very important to set this idea up. And um, I'm going to come back actually to the idea of and uh, Jimmy Heath, I think, can actually explain it much better than I can. Can you tell me a story about Ben West? You hear that? <clears throat> I was over in Copenhagen, <clears throat> and Ben was living over there. And uh, Ben uh, asked me did I know the words he wanted to play for heaven's sake, the song is Billy Holiday. And he said that, you know, every time he played a love song, he learned the words. Then he could speak the words on his horn. You see what I'm saying? And so I was talking to him and Johnny Crippen. Johnny Crippen said, I don't need no words, I play saxophone. I play notes. But the difference in people. Now, uh, if I was playing uh, 
love a man. The son of the battle. And I said, da 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 I want to try something I never had. I'm going to try to get the inflections of the voice. Uh, instrument is supposed to be, uh, have a voice. We're all trying to imitate the human voice. That's why Johnny Hodges and Paul Gonzalez and Ben Webster could play a ballad in such people. So the way you move the pants between the two approaches that you talked about, da 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 da, he's doing a very mechanical thing. And then he has the voice feeling so sad. That's, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Um, I'm going to show you another video very quickly. That kind of compliments that there is an interesting and important insight to the dancing. Because when you're going to stop playing the horn, what's going to happen is the horn is going to stop playing you, which means you're going to stop moving your fingers. And what you will hear is not what you hear without the horn, it will be where the horn plays. You know? It's so like when I'm playing the piano, I'm doing this. You know, I mean, you know, it is mechanical. I can hear what I'm playing, but I cannot play what I'm not playing what I hear. And I should be able to play what I hear, which means it should go from the hearing to the playing. There is a good way to practice this: is to mute your playing. For example, if I do this. hearing something and I know how I can play it, but the fact that I don't play it leads to the fact that I don't hear it on the instrument. So I know what I'm hearing is really what I am hearing as a musician, not as an instrumentalist.
but personally, I've never done that other thing where he just mutes his piano. He just puts his instrument aside. And you know, that's exactly the same thing that Jimmy Keats does. And, um, you know, come back to the instrument. When I started this, I knew it had something to do with this instrument, but I didn't know what it was that I was interested in. And eventually I realized it wasn't, you know, I'm interested in saxophone per se. I'm interested in trying to, you know, take the saxophone and make it into architecture. I'm not trying to celebrate the saxophone. I'm trying to, you know, what I gained from my music lesson was kind of coming to terms with this instrument, with this thing that, you know, is kind of the thing I have to deal with as a musician. And that thing that, um, the, the second video I showed you, the pianist's name is John Michel Pilk. Um, what he said about, you know, the coming from you to the instrument, not the other way around, that kind of made me really kind of critique uh, what I was doing uh, with my own work. And um, just to show you kind of what, you know, the, the kind of, uh, just to demonstrate kind of what the implications are of kind of coming back to the voice uh, when it comes to um, playing the saxophone. Um, you know, I, I think I, what I realized was that most of the work in, um, in the music is actually working on those vocal inflections that Jim Key was talking about. That's how you actually communicate to somebody with your music, is to kind of convey that sense of conviction that originates with you and not with the instrument. You know, so when he says, um, and I'm going to sing a little bit, um, and then he says, I don't know why, when I hear that, you know, the why especially, I kind of concentrate on that, and what is the shape of that? To me, it's kind of opening up like that, because it's a sense of uncertainty. You don't know, and there's kind of painful not knowing with the I don't know why, and when I play that, Eventually what I did was I pushed the knife into the wood 
and then I stopped before the blade came through. And then the wood kind of raised up like this, and the shading kind of curls backward. And you know, if I don't drag the knife through, it just kind of stays and freezes like that. And that became a moment for me to just kind of look at that and reflect on that for a while. And I thought it was something that I wanted to pursue. And I just kept making these things. So these are just some sequences of me working with this tool that's called a karadashi. Um, just working with a piece of wood, just kind of raising these shadings. Just another piece of wood doing the same thing. And again, the same thing. You know, different pieces of the wood will have kind of different <coughs> qualities about it. Um, but of course, after doing that for a while, you kind of realize you can't do a piece of just this. So um, I thought about you know, how am I going to how am I going to explore this further? How am I going to kind of change this thing, the scale? And um, something that was obvious to me at the time was, well, if a little knife makes a little shaving, um, why don't I get a big knife? Sort of do a big shaving. Um, but it didn't turn out well, actually, because the axe, as it goes in, it has a lot more momentum. And what it does to the wood, as you can see in this bottom uh, photo, is it, it kind of um, splinters it. So it's the, the kind of uh, shading it's raising, it's just showing the trauma of that cut. That it's a very different quality. But, um, so I realized this, you know, I'm, I'm remaking it, but I'm not remaking the same thing anymore. It's still wood, it's still a blade, it's still kind of just me with my hands going like this. It's a very similar motion um, as far as going like this and going like this. It's just it's the difference there is kind of momentum, speed. Um, Somewhat uh, the uh, kind of profile of the blade, but I think that's kind of nice. So I decided to go back and I wanted to look at some of the pieces that I work on that I thought were more successful. So I took them, I photographed them, um, I kind of got studio lighting set up so we kind of get a better sense of what these what these were. I just kind of looked at them. You know, these it's kind of Sweeping shapes like this. And, and then eventually I did this. With these brushes. And uh, what I realized with this was that you know this is capturing that quality much better than the axe did. And this is a very different kind of tool. If you look at it, it's a stick with some hairs on the end. Um, there's certainly some superficial uh, similarities. I mean, if I wet this, it just becomes a tip. But what was kind of the same, actually, is when I'm painting, going like that. So the motion is actually very similar to the motion of these things. I mean, if those things have a motion, actually, but those things I mean, they do have a motion like that they're moving, but my hand is not moving the same way, so there's kind of a reciprocity between you know, the knife going in and the shape coming back out.
And just something about what they did, you know, kind of intuitively thought, this is something that relates to what I'm doing, and also this is something that I just really want to do. So, um, originally I had the knife, the axe, and I decided to um, buy this tool, um, which is a um, bed knife. So uh, it's got a long handle and has a small blade, and the blade has this kind of this shape, so it kind of, kind of can take uh, little chunks out of wood. So this is the part that um, you know, I'm going to ask you to kind of try to feel. I prefer to be like this, but just everybody look at me from here. Um, I'm going to ask you to try to kind of feel what I'm feeling um, as I do this. There's not a whole lot that I can explain to you. Um, I'm going to ask for you to um, try to feel this. So I take the knife, grab a spoon, and I'm doing this. And that's how I cut the bowl out. And then, of course, there's kind of smaller scallops. Finish it. And uh, when I finished this, um, I remember I, I, I showed it to Robert Young and said, this, this is what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that's anything to do with my thesis. You think about it. And kind of took it and immediately went like that. Do you remember what you said? Yeah, you said like it feels perfect like this. And um, that kind of stuck with me, you know, like doing that. Because that motion, I'm doing it too fast. You really kind of have to do it slowly and maybe even kind of feel it yourself. But that is the same as that. So while I was making that, it was actually the, the way that that's being made somehow led to an experience that was kind of the reciprocal or it was, it was kind of the same feeling. Um, so after the, I did that, I just realized, well, I, I kind of want to try to keep doing this for a while. And in each of these phases, you know, I, I kind of get to a place where I feel like, oh, I've got something here. And then I'll just try to sustain that, sustain that feeling for as long as I can, just, just to get to know that, like, what does this feel like? Um, so I made a series of other tools. This is just a larger version of the event hunt. And again, it's this kind of motion. Of course, it can be a little bigger because of tool for this one has a bit more handle, and you can grab it like that as well. So you know, this is sort of a bigger version of that. Right here. And now I can really get this kind of motion into it. And if I want to use a little more leverage, I can get my hand most of these three fingers around here. You should go to like this, I think, is more kind of do it. And I can get like that. If I was working on something that didn't need to be held to the body, like this, or like that. Uh, this knife is sort of a more simple version of this one, um, with kind of a straight edge, somewhat Obtuse angle up here and a very fat blade. <clears throat> it wasn't kind of as good at getting into these kind of little tight spaces, so I had to make something with a just like a nicer curve and a little sharper edge so I could really get in there. Um, and then eventually I made this. And um, the purpose was making this. At first, you know, it wasn't just kind of making a bigger, bigger version um, of the same knife. Um, I've been looking at techniques of um, how people carve bowls. And, um, so this this is actually not a bowl. This is a, a form um, or a copper looking tool. 
but it's it's kind of the beginning of the whole uh, shaking side. And so uh, the carver was kind of made this, and then they would kind of carve the area out here, interior of the bolt. And the tool that they would use is something called a, a bowl horse. It's, it's got a horse in it. And what it is, it's the big bench to clamp, so you clamp it down like that. And then you have a tool that you get with both hands and you go like this. And um, I thought that was very hypothetical to what, what I was using as tools because it would kind of um, this necessitated this extra thing, you know, of kind of doing it with my body with much. So this was a tool that actually uh, works for that purpose because if you can hold it, you can go like this. But the disadvantage is you only get one hand. You don't have the leverage, you get two hands. So what you can do with this, plus you can hold it like this. You can scan over the piece, and then you can go like this. And when I'm just on top of it, you know, it's very easy to change angles. You can push. So the tool is
when I started just looking into different methods of making things. I looked at what people did with copper and um, one of the things they would do is they would carve um, a mold out of wood and that would be something for you to eat the copper into. And I think it was because of that I thought it was such a natural translation of the skills that we have, the tools that we have into a different form. And I, I felt like I gained so much from making this thing and then remaking it in the form of this remaking it in the spoon, remaking it in the tools, not just in the kind of the shape that they have, but in the motion that they use. I mean, this is, I feel it's a lot more important actually than this because I'm actually feeling it. Um, you know, I'm embodying it. Um, and actually, I'm just going to, for a side, I'm going to discuss that concept of embodiment because it's come up a lot for my thesis. And um, I think at first I was hesitant to use it. And I think, um, you know, thinking back to the Jean Michel Foucault discussion, what he did with the piano, you know, he embodies the piano so much when he plays like that. So this thesis is about embodiment, but I think it's about a very kind of discretionary form of embodiment. I'm not trying to embody just anything. Um, you know, if I kind of got into woodworking and got into uh, hand planes, uh, saws, um, and that way of working, that is an embodiment as well. I mean, you're doing something with your body, but those are very, you know, if I get a saw and I go like this, Sense, you might say they're similar motions, but it's not that. It does not feel the same as that. And the way you work is also not the same because the plane is set up. So you know you're taking um, something that's uneven and making it flat. Or, you know, in the case of some planes, you might be gouging into it, but you're not really removing it like that the way you could. This I can just keep going until I get a big hole in the wood. I mean, Carol, it's kind of scary. He knows a lot about tools. Um, so it is about embodiment, but it's about a very particular kind of embodiment. It's about embodiment of something that starts out with you. Um, so the copper working tools. This one is a raising hammer. It's called a mallet, a wood mallet. And these will be used. The flat side will be used with stakes. So these things. So you've got a flat surface on a round surface. So the next 
phase of the thesis is the tea house. And I'm going to kind of jump backwards a bit in time um, to uh, talk a little bit about the tea house when I built it myself. Um, because, because, you know, my thinking was a little bit different at that time. And um, so the tea houses model on a Japanese tea house a little bit in terms of the way it's assembled, um, but more so in terms of the spatial layout, which has very formalized um, temporal sequence. And um, I especially was kind of um, interested in the idea of waiting and entering, We're just in a very formal quality that has to do with time that I was interested in even back in 2012 when I built this. So in a traditional tea house, you often have a place where you wait for your host, and then your host is in the tea house already, and then your host lets you in, and then and so there's this kind of waiting and then entering. And I just like that idea that um, this experience is extended in time, and um, I have a very small space to work with, and you know I wanted this thing to be as big as possible, so I can make it big physically. So I thought, well, why not kind of make it big in terms of experience going through in terms of the time involved. So over here, this is this hung curtain is the entrance, and then the kind of the host would lift that. And then you would kind of sit on the floor um, just outside of that. So it's in a way a very kind of artificial um, division between interior and exterior because there's no actual interior. I'm kind of um, you know setting it up in terms in terms of visual divisions of saying like this is the interior, that's exterior, wait for me, open this up, come in. So there's a lot of um, moves. Uh, architecturally involved. Here's kind of a sketch of what it involves. Way outside on the little, on the little step in this area where it says weights is actually on the floor, but you can sit there. And then you enter, and then the tokonoma, which is a traditional alcove, used to kind of draw your gaze in. So it sets up a trajectory of, oh, I'm going over here. But then you actually sit kind of over in this area, so you're kind of let it turn around. Um, this, this huge sequence that happens in a very small space, it's only four feet this way and about ten feet that way. So this is, you know, if you imagine it's never something you would think about kind of walking in and turning if it wasn't for this kind of relationship that was set up. So that's the view of Pokemon you enter. And then immediately, because the space is so small, um, you can kind of see the backyard and naturally you kind of around, you know, which is actually not what I intended. What I intended was that all these things, well, I'm, I'm kind of analyzing what I did beforehand when I say I intended because, you know, I've set up this thing in these distinct regions, but once you kind of open in, it's all the same space. Yes, you're kind of let in originally with this kind of access, but so naturally, you know, if you're turning around, that it's actually a more sort of space. And what I was more interested in, this is a kind of the second tokenoma. I was calling it a tokenoma because it's serving that purpose in terms of um, an architectural device, but it's actually this area up on the left, which is a little <coughs> thing I built with, um, with a fabric enclosure um, that frames something for you to look at. And I was really interested in these kind of little moments that I thought were really beautiful. This is in the evening. And um, doing a renovation, I became really interested in this idea of entering. Previously, it was waiting, then entering. Um, even though once you're inside, the space is kind of more fluid and kind of just one gesture. What I did when I separated waiting and entering, that actually was successful in terms of, I think, initially what I was trying to do was kind of make these divisions. But I decided that division was actually artificial. And it was something that I didn't want to keep. And 
I thought about this idea of entering and, and I uh, doing the renovation. This is what I was focusing on. So what you're seeing here uh, on your left is the handle of the tea house. This picture is kind of taken from down here, like a warm eye view, and you're looking at um, the top of the tea house. Or sorry, you're looking at the, the copper curtain, which is constructed with uh, things like this, but bigger. Uh, there's seven of them. Thank you very much for And they're kind of connected um, on top in a rod, and then they're kind of all connected uh, with a rope. And that rope goes back there, and there's a ratcheting mechanism, and it connects to the handle. So you're pulling the handle to open this quite heavy copper curtain up very slowly. Okay, so. Before I show you uh, the rest of the pictures, um, actually, can you turn the light back on? So before I show you the rest of the pictures, um, I actually want to just mime out for you uh, what it looks like to enter this thing. Okay, so um, over here is uh, the concrete step that's right here. Um, the floor is about two steps up. Um, the handle is right about there. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the handle, pull it back, and use it to step on. And I'm going to pull the top here. Pull. And as I pull, the curtain wrenches up a little bit. something that traditional tea houses have, the doors are usually very, very low when you kind of kneel first. Um, and that, there was an aspect of that in my other tea house, but I didn't really know what it felt like you know, to do that. And with this, I really concentrate on this, this <coughs> what is the shape of that, right? You know, coming back to what I said earlier about um, I don't know why. What is the shape of that why? Or what is the shape of this moment that you have to come down? It's, it's, it's strange to think about a word, you know, a note, having a shape, having that inflection. It's not obvious, but there's actually a lot there to be gained, just in thoroughly, thoroughly exploring this territory. What is the shape? Another picture. Same event. Um, besides that, kind of 
and turn in, I also you know, just want to see just how I can work this reflection into the project in any other way. So this is one thing I did. Um, instead of a single piece fabric, kind of made it into four pieces, and that just allowed it to kind of catch the breeze a lot more, and fabric kind of flows. Um, I used on the floor also this one. I'm gonna get down and go like go like that. Um, get this card. Can you actually get the lights? Thanks for it. And there is some work I did on the columns as well, so kind of do that, do that, and that. We'll have the beams. Wasn't I can't remember exactly how I held it, but and something like that. Or even like that. Um, just drapery that I hung and then I put these ropes. So we section it off. Uh, this is a shot of looking at a bunch of trees through the light. Again, with this on the um, A close up shot of these copper sheets. Um, with, the, with the hammers, there's, there's this kind of rippling texture that's being created. And then finally, it's just making sure the tea house. Um, you know, when everything is kind of moving, um, it actually feels quite nice. That's it. Um, I don't think there's anything more that I want to say, and I'd like to open up for discussion starting, of course. Uh, I, maybe. Um, if anybody needs to go at this time, um, Thank you so much for your time.